I was going to do my talk. It was going to be on intuition. Here are my notes. It says, intuition, the ability to gain knowledge without interference or reason. However, being truer, and here's the other bit of my notes, the talk will be titled, I have no idea. <laughs> Absolutely none. Okay, so I will take you through bits of my life as quickly as I can. I'm looking at the time. Don't worry. And we will go for it. Here we go. Okay, so my story in the entertainment world, music business world, starts when I was 15. I watched the school band on stage and I thought to myself, wow, that's just amazing. So I formed my own school band. I formed my own school band with a guy called Andy Ross. We played and played and, you know, rehearsed and played. Soon, it was, school time was up. I was leaving. What was I going to do next? I thought, okay, if I'm going to do this, I've got to go for it. So I leave school and I become consumed by music. And when I say consumed, let me take you through it. So my day would start, it would start at 10, um, and I would be at the first rehearsal at 10. The first rehearsal with the first band would go from 10 until 2. The next rehearsal with the next band would go from 3 until 5. The next rehearsal with the next band would go from 6 until maybe half past 8. The next rehearsal would start probably at about quarter past 9 and go through to 11. The next day I would wake up again and I would do it all over again. And I kept doing it, and I kept doing it. Why? I have no idea. All I know is that I had to do it. I had to do it. I became confused by, com no. I became consumed by this music beast. So, onwards from there. Managed to get a production deal at a studio in Oxford run by these two guys. Really, really friendly guys, okay? Um, I'm in these, I'm in all of these bands, all of these bands at the same time. Um, and I go to a jam session that's in London. The jam session in London is called Backstage. It's run by a guy called Neil Conte, another guy called Ray Cosbert, okay? Neil Conte was in this band called Prefab Sprout, who were in the charts at the time. Anyway, jam sessions, as you, if you know or don't know, they're, they're places that you, 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 you play and you almost battle against each other with your instruments. Okay, there I am in the band or in the jam or watching the jam. And what happens? The guy says, the compere has stopped today. He has been signed by um, a label and we're going to need a new compere. Everybody in the room is much like this room, like this. Um, I stick my hand up. I'm thinking, why are you doing it? Why? Why are you putting your hand in the air? I put my hand. He says, come up on stage. You're going to start the job right now. So I start the job. The job introduces eight different acts onto the stage, seven people in each act. The bands play. I have to introduce them. With that, my address book becomes larger and larger and larger, full of musicians. OK, so now I'm at the stage where the address book is really, really full. I'm in these uh, three, four different groups, and I suddenly decide, no, I've just got to be in one. So for some reason, there's a guy called Steve says to me, there's these guys practicing in a basement. I go down to the basement. There, a band called De-Influence is formed. Um, but we don't have what I think is missing, a singer. I've seen this. There's a girl in the jam session that I've never heard sing. But I say to them, out of all the people, I say to them, do you know what? I really think there's a girl that I've seen. She's just got this most amazing sort of the hairdo and the way she stands. She's got a grace. She's got an elegance. They were like, OK, fine. I go. I get her, call her, get her number, bring her to the room and she opens her mouth and she starts singing and this most amazing soulful voice comes out. 
de-influence is formed, we press up our own records, we release our own first record, at the time we take our records onto the street and hand them out to like passing DJs. We went to a particular road, Darbley Street, where DJs used to walk, and we handed them out on the street. People would say that well, that would be called street marketing now. We had no idea why we did it, okay? We hand these out, the DJs, one of them happened to be a hip-hop DJ who then took the record, played it on air, and from there the phone started to ring. We get a call from a lady in America, her name's Sylvia Roan. She says to us, listen, I love you, the sound of you guys, and I want to come over. She said, there's a boss here. He should speak to you. We think he's joking. They come over, or he comes over, and he sits behind a desk. He says, play your stuff. We play the stuff. His foot's going like this. We're thinking, this is great. We're going to do it. And he says, your stuff's really, really good. Woman comes past. She's bringing some tea. She says, would you like some tea? We said, yes, actually, we'd love some tea if that's all right. She says, look, here's some tea. We say, thank you very much. She goes over, she sits in the corner. The guy's like this. Still, I'm thinking, this is great. He stands up, the woman in the corner stands up, they swap places. She sits down, she says, I want to sign you. I'm the boss of the label. Thank God we were courteous. <laughs> okay, so Atlantic Records we are now signed to. Okay, we're signed to Atlantic Records. Production deal-wise now, what happens is, is we're putting records out. We're touring, as he said, Michael Jackson, Prince, this, that, X, Y, Z. Most, we had a ridiculous amount of shows. Four Wembley stadiums on the trot. I mean, it was mental. However, okay, we get to this point I've flown to America, and this same woman that sat in the corner <coughs> pretending to be a tea lady said to me, you know what, Kwam? She said, something about you isn't just music. It isn't just playing. It's something else. I, on the way, playing on the way back, I think to myself, why? She said, why? Why? When, by the time I've landed, I've convinced myself, I'm going to start a production company. Start a production company with no money. I'm in a tube station, walking back from Hammersmith, a woman walks past me, a girl walks past me humming. In fact, there were three people walking past. I didn't know at the time, but there were three walking past. One of those was humming. I turn around, I think to myself, whoa, 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 doesn't matter. I go get a ticket, I run after this bunch of three, three girls. I say, listen, which one of you was singing? One turns round, says, actually, it was me. I saw you on stage supporting Michael Jackson. Right, OK, here's my... Can you sing? I get her to sing three songs at the platform. She sings the three songs on the platform. One of those is I Want to Be Down. Another one of those is Rufus and Shaka Khan. She then says she's 15 years old. Anybody that knows singers knows. If you're 15 and you can do Sweet Thing, Rufus and Shaka Khan, you're very, very serious indeed. Okay, that girl was Shola Amma. We then went on to produce her album. Her album sold a million copies. We then go from that to producing Tom Jones. Producing Tom Jones to producing Mick Jagger. Lots of different acts we then end up producing. We have a sort of a 10-year run. At the close of that 10-year run, what then happens, <coughs> Um, is don't forget, at the same time, I've got de-influence going and we're still touring and doing all of these amazing things. But we have, we, uh, one night, about 4 a.m., I wake up and I'm thinking to myself, I'm really angry about something, and that's that we do not have events in which people in the music industry talk about the industry. There's not enough events in which that happens. And I don't know why it was a bug in my head. I called up a friend, Andrea. She says, I know how we can do it. We're going to set up some tables. So we set up some tables. We invite some friends around, uh, some bands around to talk, 
They start talking, and the next thing we know, we've formed a thing called the Urban Music Seminar. The Urban Music Seminar carries on, goes from 500 people to 15,000 people over the course of six to seven years. Um, <coughs> and from that, I guess, my address book goes from this size to this size to this size. At which point, many acts come and they say to me, do you know what? I'm really interested in you managing. Managing. And I'm thinking to myself, manager? Are you sure? So I say, OK, fine. Hold on. I take one of those on. I have to say, my first run in management, my first two and a half years, Dreadful. Absolutely terrible. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know whether it was a sound of a hit, not a sound of a hit, whatever. However, while all of this was going on, for some reason, on Facebook, I was putting, posting one question each day. I got to question 94, and I put, for some reason, I have no idea why, I put, who is the most underrated person that you know. I'll repeat that. Who is the most underrated person that you know? A couple of people wrote down a couple of names, but it seemed that two or three people had written the same name. I thought, hold on, let me, let me just see. I follow this, follow the name, go to a link, listen to this girl singing, who turns out to be a singer called Rumour. We meet have a meeting, and I then meet her and her producer, listen to her stuff, take it to a record label. And I guess I, within six, maybe seven months, she was signed to Atlantic Records. Her album has sold close to a million units now. Um, all I can say is, is that not knowing sometimes is knowing, and having no idea sometimes is having an idea. And really, that's the end. <laughs>